I'm Bill Moyers. Welcome to the revolution, the Internet revolution. It's changing our lives as we speak, or click, or delete, or link. In just a decade, it's made sending and receiving information easier than ever. It's opened a vast new marketplace of ideas, and it's transforming commerce and culture. The Internet is revolutionary because it is truly democratic, open to anyone with a computer and connection. We don't just watch. We participate, collaborate, and create. But this wide-open access could be slipping through our fingers. The Internet has become the foremost testing ground where the forces of innovation, corporate power, and government regulation converge. Already, its founding principle, the notion of a level playing field, or what's called network neutrality, is under siege by powerful industries trying to tilt the field to their advantage. It happened, remember, to television, radio, and cable. It could happen to the Internet. But citizens are fighting back. Last spring, they flooded Congress with more than one million petitions with a single refrain, Save Our Internet. That was the beginning of a movement that has kept the outcome in play. Here's our story, produced by Peter Bull and reported by Rick Carr. It's not hype. The Internet does have the power to change just about everything. It literally puts the world at your fingertips in your home. Revolutions like this one don't come along every day. The type of revolution that comes along maybe three times in our whole existence, go back 60,000 years the birth of language, 5,000 years the birth of the alphabet and writing, uh, 600 years ago, we saw the, the printing press, and the Internet is the complete culmination of it. Never mind email and the web. The real revolution is the Internet's power to let people do things that just a few years ago they couldn't have imagined. Once there's a uniform victor, you are clear to take off runway 34 right. You want to see the world at your fingertips? Take a look at Provo, Utah. And we're clear for takeoff runway 34 right, climb maintain 2,500. Where the Internet lets student pilots use a sophisticated flight simulator at home, while the same Internet lets an instructor miles away sit in the co-pilot's seat. VR, rotate. And rotate. And keep a close watch over the student, literally. The uh, instructor could even virtually hop into the aircraft that the student is flying and take over if they weren't flying an approach correctly, for example, which is just amazing that you could do something like that from 20 miles away. And if the technology is there, you could do it from 3,000, 4,000, or 20,000 miles away. Or what about this? Say you need a medical specialist, but there's not one within miles of where you live. Lyle, do you remember? No. All I can remember, I could give my left arm and stuff to work right. Uh, do you feel normal on the left? Yes. It doesn't feel funny or numb or tingly? No. Dr. Elaine Scalabrin is a stroke specialist at the University of Utah Hospital in Salt Lake City. She's using the internet to examine Lyle Crawford, who's with his wife Janice at a clinic that's about 150 miles away or a three-hour drive. I see. Stroke is a very time-dependent disease. Basically, the a blood clot blocks off the oxygen nutrients going to the brain, and the brain can die very quickly. So we don't have time to put somebody in a helicopter and fly them here or have their family member drive them to a closest specialist. Um, and in most rural areas, there are um, very limited medical resources. You can see there's no dye going into the vessel, and there's no vessel that goes up into the brain. This high-quality audio-video link lets the doctor show them x-rays, zoom in on the patient, and even move the camera to look his wife in the eye. She makes you feel like... She's right here. She's right there. Yeah. She brings you right into her. I mean, she... Yeah. She doesn't make you feel distance at all. It makes you feel more secure knowing you got a specialist right, right there. there. Truly, we make the diagnosis by looking at the patient. Open and close the hand fast. Interviewing the patient, watching how they move, how they talk. That's sort of, you know, to be cliche, a picture's worth a thousand words, right? But most of us here in the U.S. can't get an Internet connection that's this good, unless we're willing to pay around $350 a month. 
Compare that to the net service that's available in Tokyo, Reykjavik, Seoul, Slovenia, and elsewhere, where you could get an even more powerful connection for about a tenth as much money. You are listening to the heartbeat of the Sage computer. The United States is the birthplace of the Internet and the home of high tech, but we're no longer tops in the world in high-speed online connections. In fact, the U.S. has dropped below 10th place, and compared to some other countries, we're pretty much crawling along the information superhighway. America's screwed. I mean, we basically are becoming technologically deficient. And Telecom analyst Bruce Kushnick says that the only thing the U.S. is doing quickly is falling behind. Right now, what we have basically is sort of like, um, you know, still pictures versus what's really going to happen next, which is full motion video everywhere. We're, we're close to the dinosaurs compared to what these other countries are going to be developing in the next couple of years. Kushnick says that's because telephone companies back in the 1990s promised that they'd hook us up to the information superhighway, but then reneged on that promise. The network that they promised to build, what could it do? Give, give us a sense of, had they actually built this network, what could we have in our homes today? Video basically allows us to do, for example, high-level co video conferencing. Multi-video conferencing basically is the ability to have four or five or six people with large screens, not these small little things, but large screens, sitting around seeing each other. What we have now is these little screens on the TV, you know, on your computer that are about this big and everything's jerky. Everything would be smooth. Everything would look like as if we were in the middle of Star Trek. Someday, people may want to see as well as talk over the telephone. What we are doing here is trying out one model of a picture phone, a new dimension in telephoning. The World's Fairs of the 1960s promised progress and a space-age future, but we're still waiting. Okay, let's stop for a second to talk about what all of this means and why we should care. When we say that one internet connection is better than another one, what we're really talking about is speed, how much information either of those connections can handle per second. Let me illustrate. When most of us first went online, we used what's called a dial-up connection. You'd hook a phone line up to your computer, which would dial a number, and then you'd wait while your computer connected slowly to the Internet. And slow is the key word. Websites took ages to load, and if you could watch a video at all, it looked like this, with a small picture, crude images, and jerky motion. Dial-up is slow, in part because it relies on 19th century technology. Copper wire. The miracle of high-speed wire communication is commonplace today. Lift a telephone receiver and the world is at your fingertips. It was cutting edge back when Samuel Morse and Alexander Graham Bell used it in the 1800s. But it can't keep up with the Internet. At least it couldn't until engineers figured out how to squeeze a lot more information through a copper wire without tying up your phone line. This is what's known as a broadband connection. It's what most American homes that are online have right now, from a cable television company or a phone company. It's 10 to 30 times faster than dial-up, so websites load a lot faster. Video images look a lot better, and you can do a lot more with one of these connections. But it's still limited by the 19th century technology of the telephone and telegraph. Copper wire. And so there are 96 fibers inside this tube. Inside of here, right. But glass is today's cutting-edge technology. So this one strand right here has 12 fibers in it. 12 fibers in it, You can see them at the right? very end, the very tip there, right. Fiber optic cables are long, thin strands of glass that transmit bursts of laser light and carry information faster than any copper wire. Right now I'm stripping the ends of the fibers. This is the actual glass, the fiber itself. These tiny glass fibers are connecting homes around the world to the information superhighway, around 40 times faster than the broadband most Americans get from their cable or phone company. So we're still in the slow lane of the Internet revolution. I read somewhere that to download the Library of Congress on a dial-up modem would take 82 years. To, dial up, to uh, download the Library of Congress on fiber at a speed that's available today, not